Hello everyone. Welcome to St. Louis County Library's virtual program, Life in the Soil, presented by Jerry Pence as part of the Partners in uh, Partners for Native Landscaping. I'm Sarah Jones, Adult Programming Coordinator for St. Louis County Library. And before we get started, I wanted to bring to your attention a few helpful tips in case this is your first Zoom program with us. First of all, this is a webinar, which means you should be able to see and hear us, but we cannot see or hear you. We are recording this, so it will be available on our YouTube page within a few days, and you'll receive an email with the link when it is posted. You do have subtitles now, so if you click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen, you can turn them on, you can make them bigger or smaller, or turn them off altogether. If you experience any difficulties with your connection, we do recommend that you exit the program, move closer to your Wi-Fi router, and click the link again to come right back. Um, and since we are recording, you're not going to miss anything. You'll be able to catch up on um, whatever uh, you miss in the process, so don't worry about that. Uh, we will have the chat turned on during the program, so feel free to submit questions um, as they occur to you. They'll be addressed at the end of the presentation as we have time. Uh, and I'd like to remind you a few things about St. Louis County Library's programs. Um, first of all, that um, you don't need to have a library card or be a resident of St. Louis County in order to attend our programs, virtual or otherwise. Uh, we hope you enjoy yourself or learn something new and share that with family and friends and encourage them to uh, uh, join in some of the great programming we have coming up. Um, Today's program is a part of the Partners for Native Landscaping series. The next couple of programs are the Native Plant Gardens Bring Pollinators, presented by Nina Fogel and Jenny Mulliken of the Billiken Bee Lab at St. Louis University on March 22nd, Tuesday at 2 p.m. And also then on March 23rd at 7 p.m., we have Investing in Native Trees and Shrubs, presented by Meredith McAvoy. Uh, you can register for these and other programs in the series or any SLCL program by going to www.slcl.org slash events. Also, don't forget that you can catch up on most any program you miss. If you've missed the other uh, two programs we've had so far in the Partners for Native Landscaping series, you can catch up with those um, and most any of our other programs by checking out the library's YouTube channel. Uh, I'm going to have links to all those things I just mentioned related to our events uh, and recordings in the chat here in a moment, along with a um, survey for the Partners for Native Landscaping. If um, you would take a moment to give us um, some feedback about today's webinar, we would greatly appreciate it. All right, so now I would like to introduce you to this evening's presenter, Jerry Pence. Jerry is a graduate of Kansas, uh, Kansas State University with a degree in horticulture and is the program coordinator and assistant professor for the horticulture program at St. Louis Community College on the Merrimack campus. He has been involved in many aspects of the horticulture industry, including landscape design and building, the retail garden center industry, and also the wholesale growing industry. He has over 30 years of experience in these green industries, in, and in the, sorry, in green industry in St. Louis. Thank you so much for being with us, Jerry, as part of the Partners for Native Landscaping webinar series. Take it away. All right. Thank you very much. So good evening, everyone. And thank you, Sarah. Uh, as Sarah said, my name is Jerry Pence, and I am the program coordinator for the horticulture program at St. Louis Community College on the Merrimack campus. And uh, tonight I'm going to talk to you um, a little bit about soils and share my screen with you and off we go looks great all right good so i want to thank all of you for uh coming to this presentation um i'm so glad you could join us this evening and i'd like to thank the partnership for native landscapes for inviting me to speak on this exciting subject um you know in our soils class here at the college um, we spend about six lecture hours covering this subject. So you'll be getting an abridged version of that, and I'll try to hit uh, for you as many of the highlights as possible. Soil and soil dynamics have become real hot button uh, for our industry in the last 10 years or so. 
Um, the biology of the soil has finally come to the forefront in discussions when we're talking about soil. It's always been there. In fact, it's many hundreds of years ago that it was actually um, discovered and talked about and, and scientists started paying attention to it. But the focus for many years previous has really been heavily centered on the chemistry of the soil. And the two of those, the chemistry and the biology really must coexist in order to have a healthy soil. And so we're going to talk tonight about the biology of the soil. And there's uh, three takeaways that I really uh, hope that you come away with uh, tonight from this talk. Uh, one of them is, is that I want to unlock some of the mysteries of soil, uh, if there are any to you, and introduce you to some new ideas and maybe some new terminology that you haven't heard before. And I hope that you come away with the knowledge of the soil food web and its role in a healthy soil. And lastly, that you understand that you can play a large role in the health of your soil because we all affect our soil in uh, one way or another. So let's unlock some of these mysteries of the soil right off the bat. Uh, and that would be the difference between soil and dirt. So now this is how we used to think of the difference between soil and dirt, or at least this is kind of how I was taught about the difference between soil and dirt, that dirt is what's underneath your fingernails and soil is, is something that you grow things in. But if the hands on this, in this picture are of someone who just came in from the garden, then I would challenge this notion because I think that uh, this is still soil underneath those fingernails. There's still tiny little microbes in there that are working on those fingers now. And uh, on the other hand, if they're hands that just came in from the garage, well, then that's a different story, right? So then I would say that, yes, uh, that's dirt. So we've really come a long way in how we classify and think about and discuss soil. Uh, which is what makes this such an exciting subject to talk about. It's just, there's something new around the corner regarding soil all the time. It's just amazing. I just was in conversation with somebody uh, a few weeks ago and they told me, uh, we're telling me all about uh, with the new technology now, uh, they have this uh, thing that they call bioacoustics where they can now put probes in the ground that are so sensitive that they can actually they are actually able to now beginning to, to distinguish the differences and the sounds that the different microbes in the soil make. So it's just like, whoa. And you know, it just keeps getting more and more uh, fascinating. And so it's just, it's such a fun subject to kind of talk about and keep up with and, and teach other people about because most of us have a really uh, old fashioned kind of viewpoint on soil. So as I mentioned in the past, most soil talk was based heavily on the chemistry of the soil. So when I had soils class back in the 1980s, uh, life in the soil was not even a thought. We, we, we learned a little bit about biology in the soil, but nothing like what we uh, know today. So while the chemistry of the soil is still very, very important, we've learned so much more about the biology of the soil or it's coming to the forefront uh, so much more. Um, that's what we're going to focus on this evening. So after tonight's presentation, <clears throat> I'm hoping that you understand why it's important for you to protect the soil. You've undoubtedly seen um, worms in the soil. Um, you've, if you have good soil, and unless you use pesticides on a regular basis, uh, you'll see other soil life that lives on the surface like centipedes and ants and slugs and all those things. A healthy soil, however, is not just what we're seeing on top of the ground scurrying about, but it's full of life. And it's more than what we can see and a lot more of what we can't see. And so the common denominator of all soil life is that every organism needs energy to survive. So let's look at a, a few uh, soil fun facts. Um, living soil 
um, is Earth's most valuable ecosystem. And um, that's, a, that's a really important thing to, uh, to realize uh, the value of this living soil is providing climate regulation, um, mitigation of drought and floods, soil erosion prevention, and water filtration, all of those things in a living soil, a living soil is handling all of those things. And depending on its location, it takes one inch of soil anywhere from 200 to 1,000 years to form. That's a pretty staggering fact when we look at it because um, it could even take longer than 1,000 years. So every time that we're disturbing the soil, it takes us how long to disturb the soil? A few seconds, a few minutes. Uh, think about grading that you see happening on new construction or new subdivisions or something like that. And think about the soil disturbance that's taking place there, the hundreds to thousands of years uh, that it's taken for that soil to develop, gone in an instant, uh, probably never to return to that site. And if it is, it would be in a whole, whole different state um, and, and probably not as living as it was before the disturbance. Soil traps large quantities of carbon dioxide. Um, in fact, about 40% of all the carbon that plants take in, uh, they filter down into their roots. And uh, so carbon between that and the carbon dioxide that, that uh, soil sequesters and, and transforms into usable forms for the plants, it's a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide. Another fun fact is that plants and soil have evolved over a long period of time to form a symbiotic relationship with fungi. And so that's really key, right? With, we'll talk about mycorrhizae a little bit later on and, and how that uh, affects the life in your soil. 90% of all living organisms in the seven continents live in the soil. And uh, getting your hands dirty is good for you. Uh, studies are showing that people who are in the soil on a regular basis have their hands in the soil, not with gloves on all the time, but sometimes without gloves, uh, have higher levels of uh, anti-inflammatory proteins in their system, they have less allergy problems, there's all kinds of things that are being discovered by scientists about um, the good things that that soil provides. So when we look at one teaspoon of a good garden soil, so a good fertile uh, garden soil, it's going to contain one teaspoon, remember, about 100 nematodes, about 250,000 algae, about 300,000 amoeba, about 450,000 fungi, 11 million or more actinomycetes, and about a billion bacteria in one teaspoon. And if you're lucky, maybe a worm or two. So this teaspoon of soil is teeming with life. And these pictures are all things that we can't see with the naked eye. So these are things that are in the soil, life that is happening beneath the surface that we can't even see, that we don't even think about on a daily, daily basis, that we haven't maybe ever thought about uh, when, we're, when we're in the soil. So let's take a look at some of the numbers of some of these things that you're gonna be hearing about this evening that are in um, a healthy soil. So I don't need to read you know, this verbatim necessarily, but <clears throat> if you look at the numbers of bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, arthropods, and earthworms, these are pretty staggering numbers, right? So where does, where does your garden fit in uh, here? Well you know, obviously your numbers are gonna be smaller, especially for these top uh, four that are listed here on the top, the bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and nematodes. Uh, but you could take these square foot numbers of these bottom two and do a little math and come up with a pretty accurate estimation of what your soil would contain if it was a healthy soil. 
And if you really uh, want to do the math, you could you could figure out the others as well, you know, breaking down acres into uh, square feet. So it's kind of a fun way to look at um, this whole list of of things that are in the soil, microbes that are in the soil. Um, and, and, you know, if you look at even just, er let's take earthworms because it's something that we're so used to seeing, right? Um, so you, we don't have necessarily an agricultural soil, but maybe you have a prairie soil. I'm talking to plant, uh, native plant enthusiasts. So maybe you could look in that native soil area and in a square foot, you'd have 10 to 50 earthworms, 500 to 2000 arthropods and so on and so forth. So pretty fascinating when you look at the big numbers, kind of ties in with the last slide with just one teaspoon and what you get in one te teaspoon. Because in, in, in that case, we're talking, you know, millions and billions of um, microbes in your soil. So we also have a few definitions of uh, some of the things that we'll be talking about tonight. We're not going to go into detail of all of these. I could spend one hour just talking about um, you know, identifying and, and uh, discussing what some of these different microbes uh, do in the soil. But, um, you know, these are just kind of some general discussions. I think two to pay really close attention to are microbes um, and uh, mutualists, because we're going to talk a little bit about mutualists and, you know, how things work together and uh, provide benefits for, um, for your soil as well. So on this slide, you might recognize uh, some of the insects uh, that you see. Um, and so the question always, you know, arrives uh, as to how important they are. Now, again, I realize that I'm talking to uh, a lot of native plant enthusiasts. And so you understand the importance of the insects and um, what they're going to do for the soil and why we need things. But some people are kind of new to the game. And so it's important for all of us to understand and really to understand to the point that we can explain to other people, neighbors and friends and family who maybe don't understand it as well and don't understand how important uh, all of this soil life is and how they can uh, promote a healthy soil life and why it's a good thing. Because really uh, we need things like centipedes uh, to eat other parts of the food web like bacteria and fungi. And we might say, well, but bacteria and fungi are good. Why would we want to eat them? Well, nature has uh, an incredible way of being able to balance itself out. Most of the time, nature is going to take care of balancing itself out so that one microbe doesn't uh, become too large in its numbers that it becomes a detriment to the rest of the soil life. And it's really good about doing that. And usually without our, um, without our interaction, thank you very much, uh, nature doesn't really need us to make it better. Uh, it does a really, really good job on its own. We need beetles to do things like feast on the dung of larger animals and to chew things like leaves and other plant parts uh, into smaller pieces so that then the earthworms can grab those pieces, pull them down into the soil and process them, give us healthier soil that way. So all of these things up here are really, really important part of something that we call the soil food web. Many of you have probably seen this picture in one form or another. Um, but for those of you who haven't, soil scientists have developed a diagram of who eats whom in and on the soil. So in this diagram, the straight line food chain that we're kind of used to seeing with things instead becomes this web of food chains that are linked and cross-linked to each other and cross back and across and, and all those different things. And your, um, your soil is uh, an example of this. Your soil has all of this going on and we call this the soil food web. And here's the thing about the soil food, food web. Each soil environment has a different set of organisms and thus a different soil food web. So this is not necessarily 
you know, this universal thing that all the numbers are the same everywhere you go, right? Your soil environment is different than mine. And so your soil food web is going to look a little bit different than mine does. If you have moved into a home that uh, was built within the last 30 years where all the soil was scraped off and you were left with, you know, B horizon sub subsoil, um, your, your soil food web is going to be way different than what mine looks like because that's not what I moved into. On the flip side, if I were then to go out and uh, till up my uh, yard and uh, till it excessively, um, my soil food web would not only look different than your soil food web, but my soil food web would look different after I was finished tilling uh, than it did before I started tilling. So we can cause pretty major disturbance to the soil and um, that becomes important. And so why is it important? Well, because um, talking to uh, native plant enthusiasts, you understand um, how to, how, why we should select plants for our landscape um, in, that fall into that native category, right? So, there's this incredible diversity of organisms that make up the soil food web, and they range in size from the tiniest one-celled bacteria, algae, fungi, protozoa, to the more complex nematodes and arthropods, uh, to the more visible earthworms and insects and small uh, vertebrates. So it's very diverse, and we need all of them, right? These organisms eat, they grow, and they move through the soil, making it possible for us to have clean water, clean air, and healthy plants. And so this food web is a model of how food moves from one organism to the next in the form of carbon and energy. So it's really essentially, it's, it's the recycling of carbon and nutrients in the soil. And in the soil food, food uh, web world, just like in our world, uh, there are good microorganisms and there are bad microorganisms. And good microorganisms compete for exudates, which we'll talk about a little bit later. They compete for air, they compete for nutrients, and they compete for all those things, not only with each other, but more importantly, they compete with the bad microorganisms in the soil for those same things. So elimination of just one of the members in the food web can alter a soil community. So for example, here's, a, here's an extreme example. Birds, okay, birds, uh, one way that birds help out the soil food web is that they carry, as they hop around in your soil, uh, each time they're hopping around, they pick up little tiny microscopic protozoa on their feet. And as they hop around, they move them around and they deposit them in different uh, parts of the soil. That's how protozoa get around. They don't really move through the soil very well. So they need the birds to be able to move them around the soil. And the protozoa are important because they're going to interact with other microbes in the soil. They're going to be food for some. They're going to eat other things. And so if uh, you live in a situation where there's um, a large too many cats, uh, that's going to change your soil environment. That's going to change your soil food web, right? Too many cats, not as many birds. Okay, that's an extreme example. Let's get to one that's maybe a little bit more realistic. Uh, dung from mammals provides nutrients for beetles in the soil. So kill the mammals, and you can look on here and see what mammals are on here that we don't like, that we don't want around usually. But you kill those, you start killing all those and, or eliminate their food source, then things can change, right? So if you have moles and our um, train of thought, what, we've, what we get bombasted with in the media and by uh, advertising um, companies, chemical companies, um, pest companies, is that, you know, if you eliminate your grub worms, then you won't have any more moles. Like, that's all moles eat is grub worms. And we know that's not necessarily true, but if we go through and start eliminating their food sources and we don't have the moles, yeah, they're not great, 
uh, if for, for a lot of reasons, but they are great for a lot of reasons as well. So uh, we have to learn to, if we want to have a healthy food web, we have to learn that, you know, sometimes there's things that we don't necessarily want around all the time, right? So, um, you know, rarely do we have like an entire backyard full of moles, right? It's usually like one or two moles, it seems like running around and, and uh, although they keep coming, they do keep coming. So a healthy food web really won't allow one set of members to get so strong as to destroy the web. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, nature is incredible at providing balance and balancing itself out. And as soon as things get to be too high in numbers, it has a way of correcting that. And so we have to trust that. We have to trust that system that is already there uh, so that we can um, have a healthy soil food web. So scientists have broken the food chain here down into um, what they call trophic levels or feeding levels. And so you can kind of see that across here. You have your first trophic level, which is your photosynthesizers and your plants, and that they're not really feeding on anything, right? And then your second trophic level is your decomposers and your mutualists, and, and then there's your bad ones, your pathogens and, and your parasites, and things that are going to chew on your roots and things like that. And then we have a third trophic level, which includes things like your shredder, shredders and your predators and grazers. And if we go back to uh, the slide with the definitions, um, you can see what their role is. Uh, the fourth trophic level is a little bit higher level predator, and then the fifth and higher levels are, are even um, higher level than that. So the higher up we go in the trophic levels, the larger the, the, um, the uh, soil food web member gets. So as we go a little bit deeper into uh, the soil food web, uh, you can see here on this chart that the major roles that these organisms play, they all have their role, they're all vital to the health of the soil food web. You'll also notice it's not all good news all the time, right? And you can see on this chart that there are those bad microorganisms that we spoke about earlier, right? Root feeders in particular, right in here nematodes and macro uh, arthropods like cutworms and things like that. But a healthy soil food web keeps those root feeders in check so that the damage is not too significant, hopefully, most of the time. A lot of times when, when soil is, is looked at and tested, when there's a lot of pathogens and parasites and root feeders and things like that, um, it will, the test will come back as showing that it's not healthy soil to begin with. Something else is, is lacking. There's something missing in that soil for whatever reason, uh, you know, we don't necessarily can't pinpoint that right now, but um, usually there's something missing in that soil food web. And so um, we have to figure out what that is so that we can get back to um, healthy, healthy uh, plant soil. When it comes to monoculture planting, nah, well, these bad microorganisms can multiply pretty quickly and they can do significant damage. So when we plant a lot of the same thing, um, especially when it comes to um, you know, non-natives, we can see um, a lot of issues with um, these bad, uh, bad microorganisms uh, multiplying very quickly in these soils and um, doing a lot of damage, even though we're going to talk about a little bit later about how plants try to um, avoid that and, and uh, warn each other about that. So again, we have, you know, a lot of different things on this list. And the thing that I think, uh, you know, I would concentrate on a lot is, is mutualists, in this case, uh, bacteria and fungi and, and how they enhance plant growth and, uh, you know, different, uh, different things like shredders and so forth. So as I mentioned earlier, everything in the food web needs energy. Uh, the sun is the first source of, of that energy, and it's going to provide energy to uh, the plants. And since plants manufacture their own food, 
they're known as primary producers. <clears throat> and the base of most food chains is photosynthesis, which is only going to come from the plants. And during photosynthesis, carbon dioxide in the air is changed to organic carbon, which is the building block of all living tissue. So about 40% of all carbon that's taken in by trees and other plants is gonna be stored in the soil. And that solar energy is gonna be converted to chemical energy, which is gonna be stored in sugars and other energy rich compounds that the plant uh, gives. So when plants die, they're still contributing to the soil food web uh, because as they or their roots die and they're allowed to decay, then the nutrients that they had, that they retained, become immobilized in the bacteria and fungi that eat them, only to be released later, right? So maybe we shouldn't be quite so eager to always remove dead plant material. I always think about that at this time of year as we're going in and we're tidying up everything. And um, as Roy Diblick, uh, I love to quote, quote him here when he says that America has become the land of the neat and tidy. And this is the time of year when we really start to see that when we're removing all the dead foliage, uh, if it wasn't removed in the fall, and we're leaving nothing behind, and we're coming back in with a fresh uh, layer of mulch. And so maybe, you know, maybe we could dial that back a little bit, or maybe there's a compromise in there uh, somewhere. Different situations call for different, um, you know, ways to attack um, certain things. From there, we have primary consumers that feed on plant parts uh, and feed on each other. And this list consists of herbivores and things that feed, you know, um, not only on the plants and each other, but other parts of the food web as well. You know, they eat insects and, and different microorganisms and so forth. And sometimes we wish some of these herbivores didn't exist necessarily in our yard. Um, I can speak, uh, you know, personally, especially about Alvin here. I wish Alvin uh, would find his home somewhere else, but I understand that there's a role for Alvin. And um, that to eliminate them, uh, you know, disrupt, disrupts the entire food web. So not only do they control other parts of the food web, but they contribute as well via their dung um, or when they die, uh, as the next part of the soil food web comes into play to take that over. Uh, the primary consumers and the primary producers uh, both contribute to the decomposers who in turn create the organic matter, which is then taken up by the plants and the cycle continues. And so as decomposers break down or decompose complex materials, nutrients are gonna be converted from one form to another, and they're gonna be made available to plants and other soil organisms. Now these decomposers consume organic matter as a food source and they leave behind a residue known as humus which is uh, simply organic matter in its final state and when it is the most beneficial to the plant. So as I mentioned uh, before, soil life also creates a soil structure. And the nematodes and protozoa that feasted on the fungi and bacteria are in turn eaten by arthropods. And soil arthropods eat each other and and they themselves are food for things like snakes and birds and moles and things like that. And all this feasting, as all of it's taking place, the members of the soil food web are moving around, searching, eating, making homes, all of which impacts the soil. And the activities of some food web members bind soil particles together uh, and at the same time, they're providing for the passage of air and water through the soil. And so since things like bacteria aren't mobile, they attach themselves to soil particles and they rely on the rest of the food web to create these passages that these particles will then uh, travel through. Fungi with their extensive webs of hyphae uh, are gonna travel through the soil also, and they're going to also cause soil particles to stick to them and bind them together into thread-like aggregates and, and uh, create that soil structure. And all of these things, even things like slugs, 
you know, the, what the, the, the slimy substance that they leave behind as they're traveling across the soil is not just um, for them to, you know, find their way back home, which it is, uh, but it's also something that helps bind those soil particles together and create aggregates, right? So all of this creates a healthy soil structure. And when the soil structure is good, then there's a good availability of nutrients for plants as nutrients then are going to bind themselves to the soil aggregates through a series of what we call cation exchange and lots of chemical activity, those nutrients are gonna bind themselves to the soil aggregates. And so a healthy soil life ensures that you're gonna have constant food for your plants. And so when healthy, uh, the soil will provide. So enter human intervention. Uh, so let's talk about how we can affect soil structure. When we till the soil repeatedly, we destroy the soil structure by breaking up these, these aggregates. We break up these aggregates into fine particles again. And so by doing that, we destroy, uh, we, we break up the soil food web as well. The food web has spent all this time binding these particles together, creating these nice pores, uh, giving nutrients places to attach to, keeping the soil nice and healthy. And then when we rototill excessively, we disturb them. And so there's this illusion that a good soil must slip through your fingers. Uh, and that's not really so, right? A good soil is full of aggregates and particles and organic matter that are bound together and hold nutrients. So when we till to the point that we can pick the soil up and it just sifts through our fingers, like water or sand, uh, we've really done more damage than we have done good. And it takes the soil, if you remember going way back to an earlier slide, it takes the soil a while to rebound from that. It, the, it has to rebuild itself. So when we till, we're not only breaking up the soil structure, but we're disturbing the rest of the food web. We're disturbing the bacteria, we're disturbing the fungi, we're in, disturbing the insects, the earthworms, everything everything in the soil food web gets disturbed. In fact, when we overtill, uh, you know, normally the end result is a soil that is actually even impervious to water penetration. And so when we look at a picture like this uh, with the rototiller at the bottom, it's not that tilling is the worst thing, it's that overtilling is the worst thing. And so it's just like anything else in life. When we, when we do it over and over again, and it's a repeated process, uh, that's when we get into big trouble. Sometimes with the soils that are left behind that we have to deal with, we don't necessarily have an option and we have to go to extreme measures. But a, something like this to come back in and instead do cover crops and not till next year would be the best thing you could ever do for this soil. So a good structure, a good soil structure looks something like these pictures, right? So as I mentioned earlier, um, a good soil structure is not the one that sifts through your fingers but, fingers, but rather is the one that forms aggregates such as these. These aggregates that you see here are key to healthy plants. They really are. When you pull a plant out of the ground at your house, if it looks like this when you pull it out, boy, that is a thing of beauty. Even if it's a, a weed that you're pulling out and there's soil aggregates hanging onto the roots, that's a sign of a good soil. And that's what you're, that's what you're after. They hold on to water. They hold on to nutrients. They allow for a good mix of micropores and macropores which are gonna enable that water and those nutrients to move efficiently through the soil and hang around just long enough so that the plants can, can take up those nutrients and take up that water. And it's not sitting there too long and it's not draining too fast. So now that we've looked at the soil food web, let's dive in a little bit deeper and check out what's happening around uh, the plant roots. So I mentioned the word exudates a little bit earlier, and exudates are what are released or secreted by plant roots, and they play 
a large role in the development of parts of the soil food web. Exudates uh, attract bacteria and fungi, among other um, microorganisms, and they help to create a very healthy environment for roots. And a root system has this thin area around it, about a tenth of an inch, that's called the rhizosphere. So you saw this rhizosphere develop right before your very eyes around these roots. And, we, and, and so it's, it's this jelly-like substance uh, that is created by exudates and uh, other microorganisms uh, in the soil. And the rhizosphere contains this constantly changing mix of soil organisms like bacteria and fungi and nematodes and protozoa. And all these organisms are all competing for these exudates along with the water or mineral content that's in the area. And so this is like where all the action is, is right here in this rhizosphere, right? So now the, these, um, these exudates are gonna be in the form of carbohydrates like sugars and proteins, and uh, they're gonna serve two purposes. Uh, first of all, their presence is gonna attract and grow specific beneficial fungi and bacteria that are living in the soil that subsist on this material, right? Uh, and sometimes this is called um, plant growth promoting bacteria. So PGPB, plant growth promoting bacteria. And so these exudates, uh, as, as the roots are uh, secreting them, uh, they're sending out signals and they're, they're actually waking up these fungi and these bacteria that are already in the soil, but they're, you know, just kind of hanging out until these exudates uh, are, ex are excreted and secreted, and they are sending out these chemical signals that are waking up all these fungi and these, these bacteria. And these exudates also serve as a lubricant and pave the way for roots through the soil because they're jelly-like or kind of slimy and they provide a smooth ride through the soil particles uh, for the roots. And so this is a very sustainable operation here. The fact that the plant makes its own secretion and then benefits from it. So um, if, we, if we wanna talk a little bit about these bacteria and the fungi, let's look at the bacteria and the fungi as little bags of fertilizer, okay? So think about the bacteria and the fungi as like these little bags of fertilizer. So they retain nitrogen and other nutrients in their bodies uh, that they get from the root exudates and other organic matter. And these bacteria and fungi that are attracted to these exudates are at the bottom of the food web. So therefore, they attract and they are eaten by larger microbes like nematodes and protozoa and things like that. And these larger microbes uh, let's think of them as the fertilizer spreaders, right? Because they're gonna eat the bacteria and the fungi, and then they're gonna spread it around because they're a little more mobile in the soil, and they're gonna spread it around as they go, go around because they're gonna release the nutrients that are locked up in the bacteria and the fungi. So while the bacteria and fungi feed off the exudates and they get these nutrients, they don't really necessarily do anything with them until somebody eats them and is able to unlock the secret of those nutrients and release it into the soil so that the plants can take it up. And so anything that they don't need, these larger microbes are excreted as waste and that's also readily absorbed by the roots uh, of the plants. And studies are indicating that uh, plants actually can control the numbers and the different kinds of fungi and bacteria that are attracted to the rhizosphere by the type of exudates that they produce. So plants are, uh, are able to send out an ex exudate that um, is sending the signal that says, this is what I need, more of this nutrient or whatever it might be. And that, uh, that attracts the, and controls a number of uh, the different kinds of fungi and bacteria that are gonna be attracted to that rhizosphere. So it's a really pretty fascinating 
system. And, and their survival depends on the interplay between all these microbes. And so the most used term right now for these microbes that maybe you've heard is mycorrhizae. And mycorrhizae are often inserted into the soil these days uh, to help stress out plants from construction or poor soil conditions or some, some horticulturists will um, just automatically have put mycorrhizae in when they're planting. And, and so we're really fortunate now that we can buy mycorrhizae. But the thing is, we need to have the right mycorrhizae. So a lot of times in, in poor soil conditions, especially construction, sites and things like that, those soils lack the mycorrhizae that are necessary to really um, maintain productive growth, right? So all this activity is all taking place in or very near the rhizosphere. So if we enter um, human uh, intervention again, um, you can see that when you apply a chemical fertilizer, so a synthetic fertilizer, a tiny bit of that fertilizer hits the rhizosphere where it is uh, absorbed by the plant. So it's a pretty small amount uh, of what you actually put down that actually gets to the plant. Um, most of your fertilizer continues to drain through the soil until it hits the water table. So synthetic fertilizers are really only a temporary solution. Sometimes they may be necessary, but we must monitor how we apply them and instead work to create a healthy soil food web. Because what happens with most of the, most of the synthetic fertilizer that you put in goes straight through the soil, some of it attaches to the roots and the rest of it just disappears with soil with the, with the water table with, with, with in, in the pores of the soil. So contrast that with um, you know uh, organic nutrients that are developed within the soil food web. Well, these are like the original slow release fertilizer, right? Nutrients that are available from soil organisms are absorbed by, absorbed by soil particles or aggregates and they're going to be released as the plant needs them. And plants are gonna send out chemical signals through their root systems and through their exudates uh, throughout their life that will alert the surrounding microorganisms in the soil. So maybe uh, you've seen a picture like this one. And what we're looking at here is all of this kind of fuzzy white area here around uh, all of these roots, that's all mycorrhizae. And uh, that mycorrhizae, uh, is going to, again, that's like an extension of the root system. And um, it's, it's, a, it's quite, an amazing, um, quite an amazing picture. So mycorrhizae are in the soil basically in two ways. Uh, we have um, endomycorrhizae, which are uh, highly branched tubes known as hyphae uh, that enter the cell walls of the root cortex. So in the center, they can get way into the roots and they can penetrate actually into the cells. They have hyphae that penetrate the cell walls, uh, carrying with them nutrients that the plant needs. Then we also have ectomycorrhizae, which are uh, around the outside. They do not penetrate root cells, but they're all around the outside of the root and can get in between cells uh, within the root. But they won't actually penetrate the cells. And these mycorrhizae, uh, do a big job in helping um, um, the uh, root, they help protect the root from fungus and different pathogens and things like that. So uh, if we think of mycorrhizae as like fungus roots, right? They reach, they're an extension of the root system of a plant. They reach much further, sometimes 10 to 100 times farther than the roots will ever reach into the soil and they're, they're, they're retrieving water, they're retrieving nutrients that they carry back to the plant. They contribute to uh, plants connecting with one another and enabling them to communicate with one another and set up defense systems, right? So there's studies out there that have been done, numerous studies that show how 
when let's say one plant gets attacked by aphids, it will send signals through its mycorrhizae system to surrounding like plants, warning them so that they can then begin to develop, to develop their defense systems and get them against those very same aphids. So it's a quite a, uh, an, an impressive uh, system that's working underneath the ground. So why would you wanna destroy that, right? Why after you planted these plants, would you wanna go in and, and destroy that? Uh, lucky for us, again, we can purchase mycorrhizae for difficult situations to kind of give our plants a jump start, um, which is a much better solution than solely relying on synthetic fertilizers um, to, um, to help us out. Because synthetic fertilizers are not going to correct uh, a bad soil situation. So here's just a quick picture of um, plant uh, roots with and without mycorrhizal fungi. And this is, this is even on turf. And we know, you know, turf doesn't uh, always have a really extensive uh, root system to begin with. And uh, so even with turf, um, all of the five bag programs that are out there, all of the stuff that we get sold or attempt to be sold by all of these companies um, about their, their synthetic fertilizers, why do you think we have to put them on so often? So in conclusion, um, I hope that you've learned enough this evening to know that soil health is important, that the soil food web is important and plays uh, the largest role in the healthier soil. And that you also, you also play a very large role uh, in the health of your soil, right? Don't be this person, right? <laughs> I think this is a funny picture. I love this picture, although I feel bad uh, by what's happening. But don't be this person. Be the person that uh, understands and respects the soil, gives the soil the respect that it deserves, um, understand all that the soil gives us. Without healthy soil, we aren't healthy humans. It's as simple as that. There's a lot of good information out there in the form of documentaries and, and websites and, and podcasts. And, and this is a list of some of those. You know, uh, if you want to learn more about the Soil Food Web, look up Dr. Elaine Ingham. She is uh, like the queen of healthy soil, of the Soil Food Web. Um, but there's some good books out there. There's, there's just a lot of good sources for you to go to. NRCS is, is the organization that uh, in the uh, Department of Agriculture, uh, that can give you a lot of good information about the soil in your area. And uh, in fact, if you watch the uh, documentary, Kiss the Ground, you'll learn a little bit more about NRCS and, and what they're trying to do with uh, farmers throughout uh, the nation. So uh, I hope that you've uh, enjoyed this and I'm uh, open to uh, whatever questions might be out there. Yes, we have plenty. Um, <clears throat> There were a lot of questions relating to clay uh, soil as we have so much uh, in our area. Um, one, the, uh, one that caught my eye was that uh, the, someone said, clay soil is good. <laughs> Why are we taught to amend it? Uh, which Absolutely. I thought was an interesting question. I don't know if you wanna start there. Sure, yeah, so clay soil, uh, clay soil is good because clay um, clay particles are small, so it, it's a huge surface area. There's a lot of surface area of clay because clay particles are so small. So remember, sometimes we think of clay as being like, uh, we think of the big clods that we see uh, of clay. When in fact, a clay particle, uh, you can't even see a clay particle with the naked eye. So that clod that you're looking at of clay particles is millions and millions and millions of clay particles all stuck together. And uh, so clay particles carry a charge that is opposite to uh, some of the cations in the soil. And those, those cations will attach themselves to those clay particles. And then uh, the plant or the water itself will, will trade off with soil particles and, and release. So the particle will release some of those uh, nutrients into what we call soil solution, which is where uh, plants get their nutrition and their water. It's in the solution, and the solution is a mix of soil and water. So as the water is moving through the soil, it's trading hydrogen with these different nutrients, 
and that um, and those those nutrients are then available because sometimes when they're just stuck on those particles and and if your soil is real dry um, those those nutrients aren't actually available they're there but they're not actually available so clay is good for us because it can hold all of those nutrients um, we everywhere that I've been in the country and had discussions with people about clay soil, everybody thinks they have the worst clay soil. Everybody <laughs> does. It doesn't matter. Well, I guess it may be in the Southwest, not so much. But when you go East, especially, everybody thinks they've got the worst. Everybody's complaining about their clay soil. So clay soil is, is what it is. And it's, it's there for us. And it's, it's a, it's really a blessing to have it because it does provide, does hold on to those nutrients for us. So do we need to amend it? Sure, you know, in order to be able to dig in it sometimes, we might need to, to amend it sometimes, um, but just be careful what you're amending it with and how much and, you know, get a soil test. My recommendation, the first thing out of my mouth, every time somebody starts asking me questions about soil is, have you gotten a soil test? Because the soil test is going to tell you how much organic matter you need to meet it to, to, uh, to uh, add, it's gonna tell you what your cation exchange capacity is. If there's a good exchange of those cations taking place, it's gonna tell you if you need to add uh, lime or calcium, which usually we don't hear. Um, our pH is such that we shouldn't normally have to do that, but sometimes it's necessary. That's gonna give you so much information about your macro and your micronutrients that um, if, you, if you do anything to your soil without getting a soil test, you're just guessing. You're throwing darts and you don't know where they're gonna land. So get the dart board, get the information that tells you where the dart needs to go so that you can, you can add the right things. Great analogy. Um, that leads us on a side tangent. We did have a question about, um, about soil tests. Um, and it sounds like from what you were just discussing that uh, the soil tests do look at the biological composition of that soil sample. Their question was, was it only looking at the chemical composition or was it looking at the biological and how would that affect the approach for the sample taking the sample so general a general soil test will give you uh, what your organic matter content is it will not likely tell you about any of the microbes or anything in your soils that would be a much more extensive test um, i'm sure those tests are out there most most homeowners um, don't really request that kind of information um, I think that if you can get your organic matter reading, that's you're well on your way because it's going to tell you, you know, where you need to go. And right, we only need somewhere in that three to six percent organic matter content. That's all we need. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, much above that, and, and organic matter, just like anything else, starts to have the reverse effect. Too much of a good thing, right? So. If you've been adding organic matter to your soil for a long time, every year, year after year, you might want to get a soil test this year and make sure you should continue doing that. But most soil tests will not tell you that detailed of information as far as microbial activity and things like that. Those are good points. Um, to then be, doing what we always do may not be the best, the best move. Um, right. It's good to just, you know, double check one, every once yeah. in a while. So that led to inevitable questions that have come in since you started talking on this point. Um, who does these kinds of soil tests? How can a homeowner um, obtain a soil test? Sure. Um, University of Missouri Extension does those soil tests. They have an office in Kirkwood. Um, you can um, pick up a little takeout. It looks like a little takeout food container uh, <laughs> from them and uh, fill out the form. They tell you how to get your soil tests. And, or how to, how to collect your soil, mix it all together and, and, and put it in this container. Uh, there's also another company called Waypoint, which uh, actually has a, a really fast turnaround. They give you a little bit more information. It's a little bit more, <clears throat> the University of Missouri Extension soil test is, is kind of agriculture related. And this mm -hmm. Waypoint tends to be a little bit more uh, urban, suburban, homeowner kind of uh, related soil test. Awesome. Um, and someone said there's an office in St. Peter's for anyone joining yes. mm -hmm. us throughout that way. Um, and I'll try to include um, th that information in the resources we send out uh, with the, the reporting link. So uh, folks have easy access. Mm -hmm. um, great. Thank you for the, those responses. Um, back to the, the, to the clay. 
Um, you said, you know, if you're adding a lot of organic material, you meaning like compost, is that what you're referring to? Because we had a lot of questions yeah. about what, it, what, yeah. what should you add compost to your clay soil? Um, and it sounds like maybe, but you should test. <laughs> right, that's what I was gonna say, get a soil test. Yeah, get a soil test and it's gonna tell you if you should continue to add compost. You know, compost isn't necessarily a bad thing, but again, you may not need it uh, every year. All right, perfect. Um, if you wanted to to build soil other than using compost uh, or cover crops, a good idea for clay soil. That was another question. Yeah, cover crops are great because uh, cover crops not only um, protect that soil um, when there's when you're when it's not planted, um, but cover crops are great because then they die back and they're automatically adding organic matter into the soil. So if you can get into like a no-till type situation where you don't have to till it. You know, even if you're uh, preparing um, a bed, even for, you know, native plants or something like that, and you're not going to be able to do it all in one time or your timing is, is you know, getting stretched thin or something like that, um, you can, you know, plant a cover crop uh, to take the place and it will shade the soil, it'll keep it cool, it'll keep it moist, uh, it'll help control uh, weeds by covering the soil and then it's giving back by uh, adding the organic matter uh, as it dies. Great. Um, someone had asked if they had unwanted annuals, um, would it be better to cut those down to the ground and let them decay in the soil rather than pulling them out altogether? Anytime we're leaving any kind of root system in the soil, it, it's, it's going to be good, unless you've had a disease issue or something like that. Um, yes, I, I think that's the case with, with annuals as well. I would, I would just cut them down and, and leave them. Okay, great. Um, so when we when we're weeding, just I'm sorry. Let me just no, step no, in no. Go ahead. <laughs> every time you every time you pull a weed or you pull your annuals out of the ground, you're exposing tens of thousands of dormant weed seeds that are just sitting there waiting for you to do that very thing. So as soon as you pull your weeds, uh, you're exposing thousands of seeds. That's you know, weeds. You know, um, just like clay soil. Weeds are, are kind of our friend, right? Weeds are nature's healers. Uh, we need to kind of maybe rethink how we view weeds because uh, they're the first thing that covers the earth. They are trying to uh, make reparations where other plants uh, can't yet. So they're, they're, the, they're like the first responders. And there's just millions of, of weed seeds just sitting in your soil waiting uh, to be exposed to sunlight and water and all those good things and, and every and so each time we pull so pulling your annuals is gonna you know maybe expose some of those seeds and you might have uh, some weeds in those spots so just cutting them off and leaving them is gonna uh, alleviate that as well. I think um, yesterday and Dave Tilka's talk he talked about how tilling um, you know does that as well where it stirs yeah. up the, the weeds that maybe are hiding out in our soil and right, not necessarily right. the worst thing, but because also I think the weeds are, you know, a weed is a, a plant, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> right, we exactly. Weed sometimes, but. Um, and, and tilling also, um, not only does it bring up the weed seeds, but tilling also causes your organic matter to uh, break down, you know, much, much faster than it normally would because you're exposing it to, you're pulling it up from underneath and, and exposing it to, uh, the environment and so it's going to break down much much quicker and be of much less benefit to your plants mm -hmm. um, and so we had someone who was asking about we get we have questions about various invasive plants but someone um, was trying to um, eliminate some honeysuckle um, and had planned on uh, tilling under the stumps and things like that um, and now you have them rethinking that is that uh, is this something they should rethink as far as the tilling goes in the soil health or is that a necessary perhaps a necessary step to um you know reclaiming from that invasive you know uh honeysuckle is actually pretty easy to kill um if you can dig it up that's that's going to be your best um your best your best way to get it out most honeysuckle that's very small at all i would say even to 24 inches especially this time of year when the soil's wet, will we'll pull right out of the ground. Yeah, you're gonna be exposing those weed seeds I was just talking about, but that's a better solution, I think, than probably rototilling. You shouldn't need to rototill 
to get your honeysuckle out. Um, roots that are left behind in the honeysuckle, once you pull it out, are highly unlikely that those are going to regenerate into new plants. That's just not really the way honeysuckle works very often. It's mm -hmm. usually wanting to come back from that initial stump. Unlike some other invasive things that have <laughs> uh, yeah. their little uh, uh, right. the rhizomes. Extensive they? Root system, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, we had someone who was talking about a creeper vine that they were having a difficult time yeah. getting, yeah. <laughs> getting those, rid of. Those kinds of things, every time you break it off, you're creating new, you know, new, new starting points. But honeysuckle doesn't really work with, like that. The shrub honeysuckle. Now, if you've got the vine honeysuckle, right, that's a whole different animal there. That's, <laughs> uh, you know, that's one that just takes a lot of persistence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to commit to, uh, to getting rid of some of those things. Um, yeah. So, let me think back to, to some of these. Um, we had some questions. I want to talk about, um, we, we're, we're getting a little bit shorter on time, but I wanted to address some of the, the animals that you mentioned, the moles and the chipmunks. We had a lot of questions, a lot of comments about uh, chipmunk activity in, in gardens. Um, and so, are, when do you know that you have too many chipmunks, for example? <laughs> Well, for me, uh, I have way too many. Uh, you know, they've got a, a serious condominium complex underneath um, my patio and they're very destructive. They're really destructive. And so, you know, I try to, to live trap them and, and get rid of as many as I can, but I'm never gonna be able to get all of them. That's just mm -hmm. a fact. That's, I would, I would devote my entire life to that. Um, <laughs> so how do you know when you have too many? Well, boy, that's a good question. Um, you know, I guess when you when you see, I don't know that I have that answer. I think that's different for everybody. Um, you know, the, there there is something to being able to have some control over what's going on in your yard. Um, what what we need is we need, you know, the, the animal that eats the chipmunks, right? So uh, the cat that eats the chipmunks, or or whatever it might be, um, and we don't always have that. And so we, you know, have to do other things. And so I don't really, I don't really have an answer as to how many is too many. Um, I know that I recently have started having an issue with voles and they're attacking, they're pretty specific about which plants they, uh, the roots that they like to chew on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so I've noticed a lot of that activity. So I just kind of am hoping that nature will sort of take care of that and balance that out. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't always, that's not always an option for us. Yeah, that's true. Um, I think that's something that comes up in, outside of this series. We always, often have questions about uh, those those pests, animal pests that we have. Um, and there's a lot of the response generally is like, well, the more we are able to create native environments that encourage a full ecosystem, then hopefully that will eventually mm -hmm. balance out. But it doesn't, like you said, it doesn't always happen that way. There are other factors involved. Well, but, yeah, there's, right. there are, there's other things, you know, black snakes are great, but, uh, you know, for some people, that's not what they want hanging around. So um, it, it's yeah. kind of to each, each zone at that point. Um, so there was a, an interesting question here that just came in a little bit ago about um, old containers, excuse me, old container so soil. So it's not something that maybe the nutrients have been zapped from. What's a good way to to use that and try to incorporate that? I guess. So one thing to know about container uh, media, right? It's not soil. Um, it has it has no nutrient value at all. Uh, you you notice that when you you plant things in containers, you're continually having to fertilize. They are coming out with uh, better products now that do have some organic matter in them. Because remember, like I mentioned, organic matter is like the original slow release fertilizer. It, it hangs on to things and mm -hmm. releases them when the plant needs them. But soil media that you put in your container doesn't generally have that. It's built to drain. So that water's not sitting in the bottom of your container and uh, causing other problems, causing anaerobic situations. And so it's designed to drain, it's supposed to drain, you're supposed to have to fertilize a lot and there, air, there is no nutrient value to it. Can you put it, can you mix it in with your soil? Sure you can, it's not really gonna do anything. It might provide maybe a little bit of help with drainage, 
Um, you know, maybe if there's roots in there or whatever, you'll get some organic matter from that. But as a general rule, uh, that that material is pretty useless uh, from any kind of a nutrient standpoint. Uh, I think that's probably my biggest takeaway. I never I hadn't really like this, you know, I dissected uh, the difference between what you potting soil or what have you um, and and what's on the in the ground and that yeah. quite in that way, other than it being you know clean. But yeah, right, it's not, right, there's right, nothing right. living. <laughs> in right, that. exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's it's. You're supposed to have to fertilize with that because it, you're. If you notice when you water in a container, how quickly it gets to the bottom, right? How quickly mm -hmm. it's coming out in the tray. Uh, that's how. That's because of the porous space. It's supposed to do that, right? And so mm -hmm. we. Um, there's no. There's no way that a plant can take up the nutrients fast enough. So even when you're fertilizing, you're usually fertilizing with a liquid fertilizer. Most of it's just ending up in the bottom of your tray. Very little of it will cling to uh, that soil media. That's why they, a big reason they started putting organic matter in those because some of those nutrients will cling to that organic matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, so, so the bench, you know, discussing the uh, fertilizer, I think that'll be probably our last question, but we had some questions about um, would you, Think that using micro, um, sorry, my, mycorrhizae is a better solution than fertil. Like, do you recommend that over fertilizer? Does it take the place of a fertilizer? Uh, that certainly would be uh, the first thing I would consider. Um, again, between organic matter and, and mycorrhizae, um, and picking the right plant, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that that should really begin the solution. It should begin solving your problem. Is it going to happen overnight? No, it didn't get where it is overnight. It's not going to change overnight. Um, that's what synthetic fertilizers do. But remember, it's just temporary. So you have to keep applying it. So, you know, you might use a little synthetic fertilizer to, to, to give it a little bit of a jump start, but at the same time, understand how much uh, organic matter you need to add and, um, and how much in the way of mycorrhizae. Now, mycorrhizae, you know, is very specific to uh, certain areas and certain uh, types of plants as well. So uh, you have to kind of search that out a little bit. You can you can find online, you know, where to purchase uh, mycorrhizae. There's a, a person in at the University of Kansas who's doing a lot of great work with uh, mycorrhizae and um, has a business where she sells mycorrhizae and she's done a lot of research. Um, but the other thing is that I just mentioned um, real quickly is selecting the right plant. I think too often we're, we're selecting plants based on uh, it being a plant that we want. And I would love it if we could, if we could get to, to, a, to a point where we're like 75% native plants, 25% non-native. And if we could get to a point where we're 75% buying the plant that fits into what our soil test is telling us that we have, mm -hmm. that's going to be the easiest garden, you know, that you're ever going to grow. <laughs> but we don't always want to do that, right? There's certain plants that we really like that we want to have. And so mm -hmm. we adjust our soil to accommodate that plant. And that's mm -hmm. always a tricky situation. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because you can overdo it, and then you can't grow other things in that soil. So if you're, if you're wanting to put plants in that need a highly organic, slightly acidic soil, and then you go put uh, echinacea in there, well, your echinacea is going to fail, right? You don't get to really have it both ways. You, so you, you kind of have to decide which direction you want to go and go that way. But your most successful garden is going to be, I think, when you get a soil test and then you decide, okay, so here's what my situation is, what plants like those kinds of soil conditions. Well, what a, a point to end on. Uh, I think you've given uh, everyone here a lot to consider <laughs> as they think about their gardens. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, we weren't able to get to all the questions, but I hope you'll continue to um, check out these webinars because I think a lot of the things um, we weren't able to touch on will come up in the other, um, the other talks. So. Uh, thank you all once again, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. You can expect to see uh, the link to the recording in the next few days with some resources uh, as well. So.
Thanks again. Have a great night. All right. Thank you.